Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Emory Climate Talks. I hope everybody is enjoying the Black History Month and happy belated Lunar New Year to those that celebrated it last week. My name is Eri Saikawa, and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. This is the second Climate Talks conversation this year, and we're so glad to have you with us today. This webinar series is made possible by our anonymous donor that supports our trip to the UN Climate Change Negotiations, and Emory Climate Talks is in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. I would also like to give a shout out to Leah Thomas, who makes everything work behind the scenes. We have many great speakers coming up this semester, and we are getting very busy planning for the upcoming semester as well. So please check out our website and subscribe to our newsletter. For the past talks, um, please do check out our YouTube channel and subscribe. We are recording today's talk as well, and we will make it available to you in the next couple of days on the YouTube channel. For the recording purposes, we have muted your microphone, but if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to use the chat function to type up the questions so that we can raise them during the Q&A session. So today, I cannot be more excited to have Ms. Jackie Patterson, and I'm so delighted that Ambika Natarajan made today's talk possible. Ambika is a senior at Emory, majoring in chemistry and minoring in global development studies. She went to COP25 with me to Madrid in 2019, and she has been engaged in Amplifier podcast, season, uh, sorry, podcast this season as well. For those that have not listened to our episodes, I hope you will take the time to check it out on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We have a subtitle, Raising Voices Against Rising Temperatures, and we are hoping to amplify people's voices. I think that there is so much linkage to what we will hear from Ms. Patterson today as well. And I wanted to ask you for a request today. If you are able, I hope you would consider donating to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, that Ms. Patterson directs. They are doing so much for advancing the Black agenda, and I would really love it if you can join me in supporting their work. The information will be posted on the chat box for those that are interested and able. So now, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ambika to introduce our speaker. I'm so honored to be introducing Jackie Patterson as the speaker for today's event. Ms. Patterson currently serves as the Senior Director of the NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program, which addresses climate change as a civil and human rights issue and provides resources and supports community leadership in this area. With her oversight, this program has launched several impactful campaigns since 2009, including the Gulf Oil Drilling Disaster Campaign, the Coal Blooded Campaign, the Just Energy Campaign, and the We Stand with Flint Campaign, among several others. This program has highlighted how climate change contributes to racial injustice through reports such as Fumes Against the Fence Line, which addresses the health impacts of air pollution from oil and gas facilities on African-American communities. It has also provided extensive guides such as the Coal-Blooded Action Toolkit, a step-by-step -step framework to assess the impacts of coal pollution on, in one's community, raise awareness and build a coalition, and ultimately engage in legal measures to address the issue and begin a just transition. Ms. Patterson herself holds two, ma two master's degrees, one in social work from the University of Maryland and one in public health from Johns Hopkins University. She brings a wealth of experience and an interdisciplinary approach to the program, having worked in roles spanning from researcher to coordinator to activist on projects related to women's rights, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. Ms. Patterson co-founded Women of Color United, worked as a senior women's rights policy analyst for Action Aid, and served as the assistant vice president of HIV AIDS programs for IMA World Health, during which she provided management and technical assistance to medical facilities and programs in 23 countries in Africa and the Caribbean. She has also served as the Outreach Project um, Associate for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, as a research coordinator for Johns Hopkins University, and as a US Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica. Ms. Patterson has published numerous articles and book chapters, including um, The Gulf Oil Drilling Disaster, Gendered Layers of Impact, as well as the piece titled And the People Shall Lead, 
centralizing frontline community leadership in the movement towards a sustainable planet. Her experience both within and external to the NAACP has highlighted how marginalization can occur at the nexus of variables such as overt and institutional racism, gender, climate change, and health, and her work has been centered around community-led social justice and empowerment. I greatly admire Ms. Patterson's resolutely inter interdisciplinary approach to solving some of today's greatest challenges, as it is not something that can be taken for granted. We are so appreciative and excited for you, Ms. Patterson, to be speaking here at Emory today, and I will now pass the presentation on to you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all, and I'm definitely looking forward to both uh, sharing a little bit and then certainly conversation with you all. So, so I was asked to, to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the, the path to, to this work and then talk a little bit about the actual work that we do. And so I'll first share a little bit from a uh, presentation that I put together on kind of the, 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 the path that led me to, to climate justice work. Um, and you've already heard a little bit about it in the bio. So, uh, and so I will, uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a pictorial um, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, tour of this, uh, of this life. And so um, I think as was mentioned, I served in Peace Corps in Jamaica, but I'm also Jamaican. My, uh, my dad was Jamaican. My mom um, was from Mississippi. And so I, um, my, my mom was born to, uh, to her, my grandfather's name was Elsie Ficklin. And um, he was actually a retired employee of the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, which was interesting because it was only when I was starting to put together this presentation that I um, even knew that, um, which was um, not this particular, when I was putting together this presentation for another, uh, for last year um, that he worked at Firestone. And so that was, that was a, uh, a, uh, a revelation, but um, and particularly given the work that we do now with Liberia and, um, and their history with, with Firestone. Um, so uh, this is a, one of the earlier uh, pictures that we have of my brother and I dancing in Jamaica, my father standing behind us when we went there and us two, my brother was, was three, well, was five. And, um, and it was, it was one of our early, early images, uh, um, this picture, but the kind of innocence of youth when this picture was taken, I was struck then by, kind of, by we, there's the, the story that was often told about the fact that people, the tourists thought that we were Jamaican kids who were like, you know, from Jamaica. And then, and then the image of this person that you see who's taking a picture of us and, all, and a lot of the kind of white tourists took pictures of us dancing. And at that time, you know, it felt like just this innocent thing. And now in retrospect, the kind of, um, you know, in the in light of uh, kind of a, a increased awareness around racism, around extractivism and so forth, I kind of started to see it in a, in a different light um, and, and, and as I kind of reflected back on this history. Um, this is us at the, at the famous Duns River waterfalls in, in Jamaica. And, um, and just that, that time of, again, being a child and discovering my roots in Jamaica and really um, being a part of the culture there. And then, and then later on, really reflecting on the history of being of Caribbean descent and the history of, of Jamaica and how Jamaica was colonized and the history of the United States and the colonization of the United States um, and so forth. Uh, it was all kind of um, all kind of interesting to reflect on as I put together this picture. Is Ivy, who was seamstress, or he is a seamstress in Jamaica as well, kindergarten, um, and, and so forth. And I, Jamaica was always a, a kind of a constant. This picture was when I actually went back to Jamaica 
um, at, in the Peace Corps and served as a volunteer doing special education um, training um, for, and this is the project that I work at, the 3D project, which was, which stood for dedicated to the development of the disabled, which again, in those times in that place I actually was interested in going to Jamaica to become a Peace Corps volunteer because I was concerned about how special ed was being done in the United States. And I was interested in kind of learning how special ed is done in other places to, to help me to be able to kind of contextualize and think about new ways that we can think about special education. I ended up with a whole different education that, uh, that I'll talk more about, but this was one of the lessons that we did in one of the classrooms of where I was in, in this rural part of Jamaica called St. Thomas. So, I also learned, this is uh, my friend Linda, we were, she lived in this place, she lived actually in um, kind of a rural part of St. Thomas and her um, partner at the time, his name was Churchill, which was also something that, you know, kind of my younger self didn't necessarily kind of make these connections, but then as time wore on, this notion of someone being named Churchill, who was from Jamaica um, and, and seeing again the ties to, to colonization and so forth. But he, he and they were beekeepers in the rural area in Jamaica. And um, I always had a, fear, a healthy fear of bees, but they gave me a very good appreciation of, of bees and really understand a deep understanding of, of beekeeping as well as the, the, centri the, the, the critical role that bees play in our, in our ecosystem. Um, this is the group of folks that we work with in, in terms of special education. One of the things that uh, I did as a special education teacher there was working with, or a trainer, was working with a group of three-year-olds who were all hearing impaired as a result of a rubella outbreak that happened in Jamaica. And I guess if a mother has rubella, then there's a great likelihood that her child will be born with a hearing impairment. So that that was also kind of a beginning of an education around what we take for granted in terms of having an MMR um, um, immunization or vaccination when we we're young, which was not something that the folks in Jamaica could at all take, take for granted. And that not having that meant that they had an entire populace of three-year-olds who, had, who, had, uh, who were hard of hearing as a, re as a result. And then also started to have education around the extreme in a place like Jamaica where the tourist areas are just dripping in opulence and wealth and then you have places that are so um, that are so uh, deprived of, of resources where people don't even have the most basics in terms of vaccinations. Um, after I came out of Peace Corps, I actually went out of, on a visit to Senegal and this is the, what they call the door of no return. And I took this picture and they call it the door of no return because it was a place called Ore Island where people who were, um, people who were uh, taken in the transatlantic slave trade, that was the door that people were, were taken through and loaded into the hulls of ships to become the enslaved persons um, that, that built um, the United States. And so going and, and, and visiting there was an extremely moving um, experience and an education in terms of our history of extraction and to really stand on the grounds where where we we should have could still be, be living in terms of um, our families our heritage uh, what would have been our generational wealth while we were stripped away to then become the generational wealth of, of um, fam white families in this nation Says, am I muted? That's weird. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. You can, okay, because it said something about being muted. Anyway, um, so you can see on the white paper there the uh, Gore, um, the Gore um, um, name there. And so it, uh, yeah, so that was a very moving experience to, to be there and know what, what happened in that, uh, in that land. So, oops, yeah. Um, yeah, and so this is a place where uh, the children, Enfant is uh, obviously children there. And that's where the children um, were, were gathering as they were, as this was happening. So, 
So then um, fast forward um, to when I came back out of Peace Corps, I went to school at University of Maryland and we were a group that um, we established association, uh, a, a chapter of the Association of Black Social Workers the, the, in, um, as part of the University of Maryland School of Social Work. work. And so this is actually us at uh, the overnight March of Dimes um, kind of walk for life uh, thing that they had there. And my poor friend was was dozing off there, it was kind of grueling, I don't know why. Um, but uh, but so from there, I actually got very involved in the AIDS movement when I was, um, was, when I was in grad school there. And one of the things that I took on as my kind of thing was doing face paints, face painting at children's parties for kids with families um, living with HIV and AIDS. That's one of our uh, scenes there. This is all us graduating. We actually founded a group called the Organization of African American Students in Social Work called OASIS. And so as part of our graduation, we all had kente cloths and we really, we really, um, um, really were a part of the Pan-African movement and, and really making that connection to, to our ancestry and our, and our work as social workers. Um, and so from there, I, I went on to, to do work around international public health, working in sub-Saharan Africa, and um, continued to do work around HIV and AIDS and, the, and was part of the AIDS movement and so forth. And, uh, and then went in Sub-Saharan Africa really also gained this deeper um, appreciation and understanding of the ecosystem and really there where people live close to the land. Um, so whether I was um, going into some of these areas where they had conservation areas for, for wildlife or just being in places where people were we're doing a lot of uh, rituals in different places that were tied to the land. I just learned a, a, a new appreciation for land and um, wildlife in ways that was very different than my existence here. So continue there doing work and, and HIV and AIDS was very uh, moving um, and deeply disturbing as it relates to questioning the development paradigm. So when we have a place like, like Zimbabwe where I was in a place where they were in, and when I visited the hospital, there was people who were on the beds and the cots in the hospital. And then there was like a little um, mat underneath the bed that someone else would be sleeping on because there wasn't enough space in the hospital for all the people that were there who were sick from AIDS. And it was the exact same situation in the cemeteries where they had people who were built, who were buried 12 feet under, and then people who were buried six feet under because the, the uh, cemeteries were too full because that many people were dying of HIV and AIDS. And at the same time, similar to big fossil fuel and big ag and so forth, there was such a domination of these fossil fuel companies over our, our, um, our political system and our decision making that uh, that the big pharma groups were had it so that their even the aid that was going to um, sub-Saharan Africa was tied to buying antiretroviral drugs from U.S. branded companies only. Mm -hmm. So this is a restriction, and those those antiretroviral drugs cost upwards of a thousand percent of how much it would have been if we had those drugs from India and the uh, generic drug makers there. So people were literally dying to the extent that they were, you know, they couldn't even, um, they didn't have space in the, in the, um, in the cemeteries and they couldn't even make the caskets fast enough. And yet we had the system that was tied to the wealth building of, uh, of these extremely wealthy um, pharmaceutical companies. And so that really kind of got me to understand very early on the ties that we still see now in the fossil, with the fossil fuel industry and our administration. Um, so this was a image of, of uh, going on a home-based care visit with a young woman named Beauty who died two weeks after um, that visit. And that is just one of so many of the very same visits that, um, that I experienced there. So came back and actually after uh, I left, I mean, after doing that work for about five years, the next thing that I did was go after her, the last, my last day at that job, I was looking at the TV in the place where they were doing my goodbye party and 
saw the um, images of, I remember the images of like a, the, a sheep blowing out of the window as they told the story of Hurricane Katrina um, that was unfolding because it was on August 31st was my last day at, um, at this the work I was doing on international um, work. And so as I was watching that and I saw like the images on the news of people on rooftops, you know, waving, trying to get someone, I ended up saying, okay, well, this is the next thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to go down and be a part of the relief effort. So I went down and you see the little, you can see behind me, the sign that says FEMA. So it was actually a partnership between FEMA and Peace Corps that they called Crisis Corps. And I was working in a disaster recovery center as a volunteer with a group of, of people there. So it was interesting there. I show this picture because the gentleman behind me, um, I remember we were talking, like he considered him, he, he decided that he was gonna be the pe person who was going to detect and foil the fraudsters, the people who are going to try to defraud the system because he had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Nigeria and therefore he knew how to recognize fraudsters for what they were. So he thought that he was going to be the, and so these are the kind of, you know, um, uh, folks that, um, that were, that were, uh, that were there and, and, and kind of this, this, uh, this pattern of, uh, of colonialism, of, of patronization of, of racism um, really uh, reared its ugly head in that situation. And, and we see that in the development paradigm that is such a deeply flawed um, paradigm. And so even when, so we have kind of the, the outright perpetrators like the polluters and the big farmer and so forth. And then we have the, the folks who are supposed to be helping like in the nonprofit industrial complex that further complicates the situation. So brother, brother's family, adorable nephew <laughs> um, and and then kind of me really in doing that work um, really starting to, to recognize and become really acquainted and understanding with uh, the true injustices that we are we are seeing and becoming really socialized reading reading a lot started a piece of started a book club when I was in Peace Corps and read books like how Europe underdeveloped Africa. When I was doing this work overseas, I started to do work around, like, um, I did a, I started a group that, that where we read, uh, also read books like, um, uh, and their graves are not yet full, um, King Leopold's ghosts and, and, uh, and develop, uh, disabling professionals. It really started to kind of make it, have an understanding of the, the disparities and the ways that the system actually perpetuates the disparities in, in terms of extraction, exploitation, colonization, and so forth. And so then kind of starting to move into today, um, out of that work, I started a group called Women of Color United. We were part of the US Social Forum back in 2010, um, actually back in 2007, and then the next one in 2010. And then started to really do this, start, join the NAACP and started to do this work, recognizing the, uh, seeing those ties, as I said before, in terms of the disproportionate exposure to, to, to oil and gas and coal, the types of disasters that were happening in our communities disproportionately, taking those learnings from, um, from the big pharma to the fossil fuel work and from Hurricane Katrina to the disaster work. And then also seeing the opportunities in the transition that we need to make. So whether it's wind energy, solar energy, so, so solar energy, um, of food justice, growing our own food, the ways that we recognize that there is, that it's not just about the negative, that, that the alternative is in the, the abundance that we actually have in our society. And so really, in our society, in our earth, on our planet, <laughs> and how do we embrace and move away from a scarcity mentality that keeps us mired in these kinds of ways of generating energy and, and otherwise, and really moves us towards um, recognizing and embracing the, the abundance and moving towards more of a regenerative, cooperative way of, of engaging in our um, planet. Um, so these are some things I would have told you, but I want to make sure we have enough time for Q and A. But you know, uh, you kind of get the idea. So the work done now is kind of fast forward to day to today is making sure that there is frontline community leadership. The, a lot of what I learned over those years is that when frontline communities aren't in the lead, 
then we have things like the very things that I described. When we have a corporatocracy that is controlling, um, and when we have even well-meaning um, entities like non-governmental organizations and otherwise who aren't having communities in the lead, we continue to have, we go from kind of extraction and bad solutions to false solutions and um, false profits. <laughs> and then we have kind of these, uh, the, the, uh, kind of a bad session, situation getting better, but not getting to where we actually need to be. So um, I put this picture in because it reminded me of, uh, of when I went and visited, I was speaking at a conference at the uh, National Association of Regulatory Attorneys. And I came in, I was supposed to be on the luncheon uh, or the post-luncheon plenary and I came in and everybody had gone to lunch. And so when I walked in, I, I, I was kind of looking around. I noticed they had grape soda, I was very excited. And then, um, and then this person said to me, um, this is a meeting of the National Association of Regulatory Attorneys. Like she was just sure I was in the wrong place. And she just literally gave me this look like this, that I, that I it wasn't like that, but it was, it was, it was, it was a questionable look for sure. And, um, and then when everybody else came in, I realized why she, she thought that I was in the wrong place because I was the only black person in the entire room, uh, which again, uh, talks about kind of representation, leadership, decision-making. And, um, and I called her out like nicely, I called her in. Um, but during my talk, I said, this is kind of the problem, <laughs> you know, like the fact that, um, yeah, that I'm the only person here. Um, and we're talking about regulations around energy that disproportionately impact black, brown, indigenous communities. And so we really need to, to be thinking about this differently. So went on to write uh, write about some of these things like writing this document, diversity is not enough and done alone, it can be counterproductive. Um, and, and wrote kind of guidance documents, like it's one thing to kind of call it out, but then it's another thing to kind of tell people how, how we can start to move towards the promised land. And so really rooting our work in the Jemez principles is what we do now. And in various principles like the Bali principles, the People's Agreement of Coca Jack, to Bamba, the principles of environmental justice and so forth. And this is just some of the work that we've done with, with um, youth in East Chicago, Indiana, some of the healing hike work that happened in, in Colorado. Um, we actually took a group of youth, black, black youth and indigenous youth to Iceland because they had these introductory fairs on Iceland air of $250 round trip. So we had this group of youth, black and indigenous youth that went to Iceland because they were all coastal dwelling youth in the US that were being impacted by sea level rise. So we decided to go where those melting ice caps were that they are now finding in their backyards in the form of, of flooding and inundation. And really just went and it was an awesome kind of experience with these youth who were talking about their experience with land and water, really talking about their origin stories, talking about their spiritual connections to the land and water and really bonding around finding more commonalities than they would have expected. And so this is some of the other work we've done, making sure that we're at the EPA hearing, showing up, making sure that our voices are being heard. And um, just wrapping up with making sure that as I kind of think about career and the lessons learned, one of the big lessons was the importance of vision and having frontline community, being led by frontline community vision and what is wrought from that. Um, really listening, deep, deep listening has been critical to the work that I've, that I've been able to do in different places and the, the, the program that we've built with the NAACP. Um, integrity being critical um, in terms of speaking truth to power. Um, this is part of my um, email signature. One of the truest tests of integrity is its blunt refusal to be compromised. Um, and fortitude, because there's just there's been a lot to kind of stand up against in terms of, and it's really taken um, that fortitude and patience and endurance in the face of kind of whether it's big pharma, big ag, big uh, big fossil fuel, you really have to to uh, to stand strong, be patient, and definitely have faith. And humility. I was uh, talked about when I went and visited a, a community, and we were talking about some pipeline that was being built there. And the guy kind of casually mentioned 
something about bears. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> so, and he, it, 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 yeah, he kind of talked, he pointed to an area where he had seen a bear. <laughs> and I was like, you know, can we go inside? <laughs> but anyway, so really being able to, to, to come to terms with your own little shortcomings and so forth and to be able to laugh about it has been critical. And I'll just end by saying that a lot of the work that we the work that we do now is around advancing model practices and model projects advancing model policies and around shifting the narrative because we've seen how whether it's job killing regulations or black folks being called super predators or all the different ways the whole living while black phenomena that has had deadly effect for folks um the whole bootstrap like all the different ways and so this is a African proverb, until lions write their own history, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I was uh, watching Saturday Night Live one night and I thought they, they told the story in, in, a more, in a, just as a compelling way as a proverb. But, so it was, a, it was one of those weekend update things and it says, as, as told in the local newspaper, hunter thinking deer was dead was injured as the deer jumped up and gored him and that was the headline. And then it said, or as the story was told in the deer community, serial killer injured as victim fights back. And so that I thought was the best representation of the power of who's telling the story um, and the power of narrative. So thank you so much. Uh, it's really a joy. I look forward to the, our kind of discussion. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go straight into the Q&A. So, um, I guess the first question that was asked was by Maggie and she asked what's a frontline community um just sort of in the terms of how how you're referring to them yeah sure yeah so people talk about frontline communities they also use the term fence line communities but it's basically a community whether it's physical or otherwise but the community that is really uh, most proximate to whatever the injustice is. So frontline communities could be, you know, LGBTQ folks who are uh, facing um, homophobia or anti-LGBTQ sentiment. It, it's definitely in the case of environmental and climate justice, folks who are living next to the coal fire power plants or the oil and gas industry or, or the different um, uh, sites of pollution, the landfills and so forth. So it's whoever is kind of on the front lines um, facing the injustice in the most proximate way. Thank you. Um, and then Beth asked, why an interdisciplinary approach? Um, why is that important? Are funders and nonprofits realizing that um, from someone who's just gotten a degree in urban studies? Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so there's definitely a dawning realization of the importance of inter interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, we have this initiative called the Centering Equity in the Sustainable Building Sector Initiative. And in it, we have um, architects, we have public health folks, we have um, housing advocates, we have um, all um, ed higher education folks. And without all of those folks involved, it, like none of them in, uh, by themselves or even a couple of them would be able to address the issue of making the places that we live, work, play, pray, et cetera, um, learn um, more uh, energy efficient, um, uh, disaster resilient, um, healthy places that embrace culture and that work for people and that are built on regenerative design. We need all of that in order to be able to, to do that. And so that, 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 um, that is true in so many different areas because of um, kind of this intersectionality analysis that says that um, that that the the as it, I think it was Audre Lorde who said that we 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 um, don't live single issue lives and so there that intersectionality in terms of impact requires an intersectional and interdisciplinary um, set of solutions to advance. And so, like I said, philanthropy is definitely growing to understand that. That's one of the things that we're hoping that with this administ new administration, as they bring on folks who are who are from frontline communities, who get that we don't love single issue lives. Um, and who understand the inextricable connection of, of so many things will also get that as well as we think about uh, solutions from a federal policy perspective. So, thank you. Okay. 
Um, so Margaret uh, Lowe was asking if you could tell him if you could speak more about some of the model policies that you're working on. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so many actually. Um, we actually have developed this group, uh, this uh, formation called BALIC, the Black American Legislative Equity Council as an alternative to ALEC, which is doing a model policy on everything from school privatization, to prison privatization, to voter suppression. And so for us, we are, instead of just fighting against the flawed policies and the, the you know, fundamentally of oppositional policies that they're putting together, we're putting together model policies that we can also put into the hands of, of legislators. So everything from recently, one of our, um, so just I'll just talk about the ones that have come to, that we've developed based on requests from our members. So last year after the, the tornadoes in, um, in Nashville, they asked me for a model um, ordinance that would help to protect them from gentrification and displacement because they had experienced that for past disasters. So we put together a model policy or a model ordinance around that. Before that, with the Portland Clean Energy Fund, they based that on our um, principles of climate justice that we had come up with as the Environmental Climate Justice Program. Most recently, the um, the Ohio NAACP is fighting against um, fracking. So they asked us to come up with a model state policy around um, anti-fracking that specifically um, it requires companies to disclose what is in the It seems like we're having some technical issues. We cannot hear her for a moment. Yeah, hopefully she can come back uh, soon. But in the meantime, if you can put the questions in the chat box, that would be great. And sorry for the technical difficulties. I think she dropped, um, hopefully she can come back. Let me. Yeah, I apologize. I'm not sure if she's going to be able to come back. I, I would certainly hope so. But in the meantime, I put that on the box uh, in the chat earlier. If you didn't come um, in time, you might not have seen it. But um, Jackie was very gracious to um, provide this talk um, voluntarily. So I really uh, hope that you will be able to um, support the group with some donation. That's what she um, said that that what would be most helpful. So I am putting it again in the chat. If you are able to support, um, please consider donation. And that was the way that she wanted um, this group to be supporting her. So um, we will give a, a couple more minutes. Hopefully she will be able to come back. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. What a great uh, turnout. Um, very very excited. And thank you, Ambika, for leading us. OK, there she is. Hello. <laughs> my, it was tethered to my phone, and then my phone died, even though it's plugged. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, we could move on to, I think, a, a slightly related question. Um, so, so Shannon Anderson asked, in your experience, um, at what level of government can policy be most effective 
in addressing environmental injustices? Yes, just another great question. So um, we have found that, so uh, over the last four years, of course, we have focused very squarely on state and local policies, um, given the circumstances and light, it played light defense on federal policies. Um, so, so one of the best pieces of legislation that we passed, that we were part of passing was the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And, uh, and, and then also another great piece of legislation was the, you know, the, the Illinois Future Energy Jobs Act. Um, one of the things, the things that were important about both of those was for Portland, the real, again, grassroots led effort to, to pass that policy and the real tangible benefits that they're going to experience as a result. And the power of it was in being able to carve out something that was tangible at the local level. So in that sense, I really do love kind of municipal level policies. Um, and, and, and the good thing about the NAACP with 2200 branches and chapters is that a municipal level policy that happens in one place, we have the connections and power to be able to replicate it in other places. But at the same time, that's a pretty slow roll, you know, to see. But at the same time, it can be, it can, it, they, it, it, it's really where kind of some of the more transformational policies happen, like what we saw with Minneapolis in the whole um, deconstruction and, and reconstruction of the police department. Like that's only going to happen at the local level. And that's the most transformational kind of thing that we can see happening, like, uh, you know, total, not just kind of tweaking something that's so deeply flawed, but actually rethinking how it happens all together. And that, that in that sense, the whole kind of all politics are local adage is definitely, um, there, that's definitely where you can kind of find the most in the way of consensus, the most in the way of analysis of like common values and common interests and, and kind of where you can make, you know, politics and party politics fly, uh, fall away because we're kind of talking person to person about what we want out of our lives and for our families and for our communities. So I'm a big fan of, uh, of localism and municipal policies. But at the same time, with climate change, we really need change at scale. And so we need to kind of rapidly multiply to the extent to which we're passing local, um, local policies. But we also do need uh, federal and state policy because we need, as I said, rapid intensification of the type of transformation that we need to, to stave off uh, catas more catastrophic climate change. So, so that's a good fence straddling answer, but um, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then Christy Paris wanted to ask, um, can you tell us more about some of the ways in which you work to change the narrative regarding BIPOC and environmental racism? And how can students um, become more involved in these initiatives? Yeah, thank you. Um, definitely, I mean, students are really the key in a way. Like a lot of our narrative shift work has focused on the ways that youth can particularly still tell stories and weave a narrative in a way that's most compelling of, of, than any of us. Um, so we, for example, we put out our fossil fuel foolery report, which what we like about it is that it takes real serious ways that fossil fuel companies manipulate our communities, but then it uses um, humor to tell those stories so that it's kind of more, so it's cartoons and, and so it's easy, easy for people to, it's very shareable and something that people want to share because people love humor. That's a definitely a universal thing. And so that's, uh, and then also um, we launched, just talking about youth, our fossil, our um, Don't Believe the Fossil Fuel Hype video contest where we invited youth to use humor to create parody videos of the manipulation tactics of the fossil fuel industry. Again, to help shift that, that narrative um, through, through humor, but then through the kind of creativity and innovation of, of youth. We also have been engaged around kind of culture work and how whether it's spoken word or, or music or, or visual arts, can actually tell tell different stories in different ways, and then of course there is um, kind of viral social media um, and the ways that and, and and 
to some extent with the NAACP, because we have our Hollywood Bureau and those connections there using um, kind of influencers, um, we have connections to influencers that can help to, to, to carry the message that we want the, uh, local, the frontline communities to develop. And then we need the influencers to help to kind of basically put a megaphone to the voices of our frontline community. So we don't want them to be spokespersons, but we want them to help for our communities to get our their, their vision and their voices um, um, elevated. So we did work like when we launched our uh, solar equity initiative, it was a it was a completely community driven effort, but but Rosario Dawson did a um, did a, a, a video to kind of pump it up. Um, we work with folks like Ben Ch Don Cheadle, who helped to to elevate through um, being a moderator for a, a panel of, of how black women lead that we were all on. And so he was really kind of using his celebrity status to, but like it was our voices that were being lifted and so doing. And so these are some of the examples. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Lalita Martin had asked, well, she had said, I'm also concerned with climate justice work, not amplifying BIPOC um, voices and including them in decision-making. How can businesses and organizations do a better job of hiring people of color, even though they can't hire people based on race? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. So we, so one of the, we have we're part of this group called the Green Equity Officers, which is a group of folks who are. There's a lot of people people who are hiring DEI uh, consultants or hiring DEI directors or managers in their organizations. And um, and so even as much as people are trying to do better by putting like a little notice that'll say such and such encouraged to apply, people of color, women, blah, 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 occur, encouraged to apply. And in their hiring, they try to, even though it's not necessarily legal, they do try to show some bias to, to make sure that they are trying to, to increase their ranks of, of BIPOC people in their organization. But part of the problem is that just kind of changing the color of who's in the room is not going to be enough. But A, if the, 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 the people who are coming in don't necessarily have the orientation of frontline community. So you're not actually getting that perspective just by hiring a person of color. But then two, if your organization doesn't already, isn't doing the work internally to make that place a hospitable place for the BIPOC person who's coming in. And so we that's why I put that, where I wrote that article, diversity is not enough and done alone, it can be counterproductive because I, had too many of, of those folks crying on my shoulder who are evacuees or survivors of those kind of situations where people just weren't ready for them. <laughs> and, um, and therefore it became a place of trauma for, for, those, for those individuals. And so that's really, so the, we really need organizations to do the work to prepare themselves to have, to be hospitable to folks and then to themselves have a more of a justice orientation that doesn't depend on this person who then like, oh good, now you can do it all, <laughs> you know? So this is the kind of thing that we have to make sure um, that we're guarding against. And so, yeah. Mm. Thank you for that question. Okay. Um, Monica Lefton also wanted to know, um, what is one book or like, piece of reading material that you would recommend um, if interested in learning more about this topic? So like climate justice centering around the black perspective. Yeah, that's a good question. I wish that I could think of an answer right off the top of my head. Um, yes. Um, so that's really bad. Um, I, I mean, I would certainly recommend um, work, works by like Dr. Robert Bullard and Manuel Pastor. Dr. Robert Bullard has written a zillion books and, you know, like Dumping in Dixie and Wrong Complexion for Protection and all of these different things. So he definitely, uh, those would always be uh, good to read. Um, and also there's a, interesting there's a book i not, not can't remember the name of the book by by jade sasser that like looks at this whole intersection of gender justice and race and climate 
from looking largely internationally, but it, but it's definitely a good um, piece of reading. Um, and unfor not unfortunate, well, it's unfortunate in terms of the outcome, but there's not, there's, you know, there's academic work that's been done by, 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 by folks and too often people are foregoing the writing for the doing. Um, and so you don't necessarily find a lot. Shalanda Baker just wrote a great book on energy justice. So Dr. Shalanda Baker from Northeastern University. Um, Jenny Stevens, who's white, just wrote a book on um, diversifying power that starts to get in some of these issues of particularly race and gender. Um, but she, she did it, she did a lot of interviews with folks so you can hear folks' voices even though. Um, and then, yeah, so those are some, but yeah, I can't really kind of say this is the one. And I'm sure right after we hang up, I'll think of, of others, but yeah. Um, Cicely Garrett wanted to know, like, what environment is in place to retain and nurture diversity in its full self? What environment? So meaning, um, you know, like, what kind of... Uh, meaning, I guess, an example. Pardon? Sorry. I don't know. I don't want to speak for the speaker, but the way I interpreted it was that there could be potentially, like, a model environment um, that perhaps you could refer to. Um, okay. Yes. Um, oh, she wasn't. She was. It wasn't a question. Oh. Okay. Move on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, if someone is interested in becoming more involved, this is um, Darnisha Tabor's question. Um, if someone is more interested in becoming more involved in environmental justice. Are there organizations that you would recommend volunteering for? Um, yes, I mean, I would definitely recommend checking out the Climate Justice Alliance, both in terms of the organization itself, but also its membership includes a lot of environmental justice organizations. Also, I would suggest the National Black Environmental Justice Network, as well as the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum on Climate Change. And, um, and also we have, uh, with our branches and chapters, a number of them in our state conferences have environmental and climate justice committees within the NAACP that we would love to have people um, engaged around. So those are all, so Climate Justice Alliance, EJ Leadership Forum, National Black Environmental Justice Network would all be good places to, to, to start. Okay, then I thought I would just ask my question quickly, but um, I was wondering, like, have you ever sort of faced resistance, like, in sort of the interdisciplinary nature of your work? I know, like, social justice, like, oftentimes it's categorized as one huge thing, but really, like, there are many different avenues, and I know you're intertwining several, and so I was wondering kind of how you've sort of navigated that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, even internally, I get a lot of... Uh, stay in your lane kind of comments, you know? Um, so that's definitely true. And then also, also, and, and so navigating that internally has been, you know, really like we, uh, we wrote a document called Intersections that really looked at, that took every, like how environmental and climate justice intersects with health, criminal justice, with civic engagement, with all the kind of game changers as they call them within the NAACP to help people to see that it's all, all of these things and more. And so there's no way to not have kind of mission drift because it's all the same mission. Um, and similarly, when um, I was doing a talk for the one of our funders and when I, sitting in my slides, they were like, oh no, you, you're just supposed to talk about solar. And um, then I, was, I said, well, okay, I'm not going to use slides. And then I renamed my presentation, Black Lives Matter, Energy Justice, and the NAACP Civil Rights Advocacy Agenda, and proceeded to you know, say the same things that I would have said with slides. And, um, and in the end, it was like one of the best regarded because people were seeing like their mission 
they were seeing like the work around energy as more than just about energy, but they saw it tied to this larger social justice kind of ministry in a, in a sense. And so, so yes, so my, I guess my pushback, my, my way of navigating is to just push forward <laughs> and to really just help people to contextualize, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, we have, um, if it would be possible, we have one more question that we'd love to ask. Um, so Scott Schner asked, um, he said, I like the way you've connected some of your own personal thinking to decolonial and anti-capitalist critiques um, of, the of the interconnections between development, environmental justice and climate change. I'm curious how, if at all, do you feel um, able to weave that language into your public work and policy recommendations? Do you think that people are generally um, ready to hear those perspectives at a policy level? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that definitely is also a mixed bag, <laughs> for sure. Like sometimes they, you know, they will uh, dismiss it as kind of, you know, Tommy rantings or whatever, or, or you know, other times people will. I mean, and it also depends on what kind of mood I'm in to be able to like really meet people where they are at and kind of try to say things to, 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 to say the same things, but do it in a way that is uh, in a way that opens a door versus kind of scaring people. <laughs> and so, um, so it, it is definitely a code switching that has to happen sometimes to, to, to put it forward. Um, but to a large extent, what I've had, what I do when I do like a pre like, so today, you know, it was kind of this notion of tell us, tell us your life story and, and weave this in. But um, with my regular presentations that I often do, I really, kind of uh, show a lot of images and I'll tell a lot of stories about just how flawed and in unjust the system is. And by the time I have literally beaten people over the head <laughs> till they're sobbing with the horrors of, of our, you know, racist, capitalist, you know, extractionist, exploitive society, there's no real way for you to be able to refute once you've told all of those stories. And so then when I talk about like the types of the level of systems change that's needed and the fact that we can't just tweak a system that has people having their electricity shut off and them dying because of because of it or you know all the different ways that you tell those stories that it gets gets people to a place where they they see that um, that the system is fundamentally built against certain people and so I'm usually able to do that in a way that people that that I bring people along with me and so that once we get to that part of of really talking about like a system that's rooted in there being winners and losers and who's always on the losing end of that winners and losers um, um, equation. Um, and then start to kind of um, name that as, as a, a capitalist society, start to name that as like the flawed uh, uh, implementation of, of development and start to name, people really start to get it. And that's why I, I um, was on the board of this group called the Center for Story-Based Strategy, because I think the, the story, a story-based way of helping to illustrate these realities is a way that to kind of get people to to kind of get it um if that makes sense yeah so <laughs> thank you so much for for giving us this amazing talk um speaking for everyone like we've all been very very excited to hear you speak um and really appreciate it a lot so thank you no thank you it was very gratifying i appreciate all your awesome questions it's very stimulating and Yes, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, on behalf of, oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we would love to give you a round of applause. Um, it's too bad that we cannot meet in person, but we are so thankful that we were able to have this. And thank you so much for coming in and thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Ambika, for a great host. Um, and we will have an event uh, again on March 2nd at noon. So I hope you can join us. and. Um, have a great evening and stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.